what I want to convey to you guys in this call is it started off with our podcast. There's a Netflix documentary on Tim Donahue, which is going to make this scandal a lot, obviously introduce this scandal to a lot more people. It's coming out in August. Whistleblower is going to be become an FX show. Um, we're working on Whistleblower season two, which is going to be about David Stern in the NBA. And I think Whistleblower, my hope is as a journalist that we've opened up this vortex into, I think people are really interested in how stuff works. And I'm a baseball guy. I play college baseball. And obviously baseball has had its, its fair share of cheating and scandals. And I mean, if you look at all sports, if you look at tennis, um, horse racing is definitely something that we're, we're very interested in looking into. My life's work is going to be exposing all the, there's so much corruption in sports that it is insane. And this is pre legalized sports betting. So my hope is that you guys in that room will take this seriously. And if not just for integrity, then from a business standpoint, because this stuff is going to start really blowing up and fans are going to start asking questions that they weren't really equipped to answer pre-social media and pre-internet virality. So we're at this really interesting time where I think a lot of these sports are going to be looked at through a different lens over the next two, three, four, five years. Um, and I'm really interested in what you guys are doing and interested if I can help. Because the truth is there's, you know, tennis is something that one of my next projects is tennis. And I don't know if you guys know much about tennis or if any of your regulation has anything to do with tennis, but tennis's system is set up to, you know, the, the lower ranked guys in tennis or, and females, you know, a lot of them are from not, you know, they're not, if you're from wealth, that's something else, but a lot of those lower ranked tennis players are, are not from wealth and they're on the challenger tour traveling all around the world with very little sponsor money and game match fixing in tennis right now there are about nine players in the top 100 in men's tennis who we believe based on, we did a data analysis. So what they do is they drop the, if you look at favorites in tennis who drop the first set, but then win the match, that is a huge indicator of match fixing, right? Because what the, the mafias in Eastern Europe, Italy, South America, who are going to players who need the money on the challenger tour, and even on you know the, the bigger tours that are going up to these players and saying, hey, look, you can win the match, just drop the first set, I'll kick you 50, 50 grand, right? Tennis, is, tennis has an integrity unit, which is essentially aiding the system, right? It's, tennis knows this is going on, but doesn't want to fix it because the challenger tour, they, their system isn't really paying these guys enough to flourish, and so, you know, they're kind of turning the other cheek and allowing this to happen because if they don't, then they're going to be losing players left and right who can't afford to play tennis. It's just a really messed up system, right? Minor league baseball. I haven't found any corruption in minor league baseball, but as a baseball guy, the, you know, the inequality and just the ridiculous system in place for minor leaguers, you're looking at the same thing. You can't bet on minor league baseball. So it's not, I don't think you can. So that's a different, you know, different, no pun intended ball game. But when it comes to horse racing, and obviously, like, I'm not, I haven't fully gone down that rabbit hole yet, but I'm super, super interested in, in it. But it's similar to baseball, right? There's doping. There's, um, you know, there's a bunch of different things that you got to look into from a betting standpoint. And now with where the world is going, I'm just super interested to talk with you guys and hear what you guys, what your plans are to, to make sure that these systems are as integrity driven as possible. Because right now, I don't think anybody in the regulation space is really innovating. I think everything is status quo. Um, you know, I think there's a quid pro quo, quid, quid pro quo um, system in, in a lot of these, a lot of these sports. And where things are going, the money's gonna get so huge and the corruption is gonna get, corruption is gonna continue to grow. And so for me as a journalist, it's, it's good because there's plenty of work to be had and plenty of things to report on. But I also, I'm just really curious to hear what you guys, what your, what your goals are over the next couple of years to address this and to help in any way possible. So hopefully that gives you a little background on where I came from and how I got here into this Zoom call. 
Um, Ed, I don't know if you need me to go into any more details, but I'd love to just hear questions and kind of talk through just, again, my findings right now, I've spent basketball over a decade investigating this and the stuff that we found in whistleblower, I mean, it keeps getting bigger. Um, David Stern's a really interesting character who, you know, he passed away a couple of years ago and he's going to, I'm interested, you know, I, the, I'm interested, I'd be very interested if he were still alive to hear him comment on the reporting that we're about to do. But when it comes to all sports, it's just incredible how, how much corruption exists and how, how little people know about it. So it's my job to help people know about it or to educate people when it comes to this stuff. And uh, again, really interested to hear what you guys are doing. So I'm gonna ask you a question. Uh, one of the issues that is very, uh, very current, so you know most people in this room do not have authority to regulate sports betting. Regulate sports and sports uh, They work for uh, state governments, and as such, they are uh, public officials. They uh, financial disclosure, conflict of interest requirements. Uh, they operate under public records, uh, transparency laws, uh, public meetings. Everything's done in the uh, The uh, drug testing results are all posted on their website. You can see how many, uh, how many athletes tested, how many found adverse findings on what they found. Uh, if they bring a charge on somebody, it's all public. Uh, the results of that are all public. So one of the things that, that it may be I was trying to understand how we compare to say the NFL, and I didn't find anything. So, I guess my general question is too when you raise the issue in your investigation in the UK about the assignment of called them company reps, reps who uh, were company them, and who actually, by virtue of their performance, Receive financial bonuses from the league. In horse racing, the stewards don't work for the work for the most. And so they're subject to the same kind of scrutiny that the commissioners are taking records of. So, how important do you think transparency is? That's an issue that federal law being implemented. We were bluntly told that the Safety Integrity Act is not subject to uh, public records or public meetings. How important do you think transparency? Uh, well, trans yeah, transparency is everything, right? And that's, I think, historically, the, and especially I'll go back to the NBA, and you mentioned drug testing, right? And the NBA, and, and we know this, and this is something that for reasons I won't get into in this call, I haven't reported on as extensively just because of, for different variables yet. But when it comes to drug testing, right, the NBA and the NFL, and I don't know much about um, drug, drug testing and, and horse racing, um, but drug testing is a total sham. It's an IQ, oh, there's me, hey. Um, it's, an IQ, it's, it's an IQ test. It's not a drug, they're, they're not actually trying to catch people for using drugs, right? It's an IQ test. The NBA drug test, for example, is, it's just really easy to get out of it. And we found in the NBA, um, and again, I don't, I'll say this to you guys, but reporting wise, I'd have to, I have a lot more work to do. We'll just say that the NBA and the NFL, as far as performance enhancing drugs, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable how many guys are, are doing it right now. Um, and that uh, that's probably another year or two of reporting at least. Um, but it's set up as really as an IQ test and not a drug test. And when it comes to transparency, I think organizations didn't have to be transparent in the past, right? It wasn't the information fans were, um, you know, the word naive is a really powerful word, right? Uh, ignorance can be bliss, um, I guess. But 
when it comes to where we're at right now and the reporting that I'm trying to do and the untold guys and Netflix and, you know, I think just people, people, I think for us, look, we'll just call it what it is. There's a, there's a business to be had as a journalist and as storytellers investigating sports in this capacity. It's, it's a good business. It's my business now um, looking into these things and trying to unravel all these mysteries. And 10 years ago in the NBA, David Stern could do whatever he wanted, right? Transparency was, was never a strong suit of the NBA. It's definitely not a strong suit of the NFL. And I think in general, people operated 15, 20 years ago, pre-internet, there was just a different way that businesses operated, right? There was in conference rooms, everything was done behind closed doors. And now those doors are going to be open. So when it comes to the next, we're in 2022, I think by 2030, things are going to look a lot different. I think the, when it comes to all sports, all this stuff is going to, is, is coming out one way or another in the next couple of years with all the major sports. So I think any regulatory agency, anybody who embraces this early and wants to get out in front of it and be transparent with its fans, I think is going to earn an incredible amount of trust. And that's what I think you guys, based on the little, again, I don't fully know what you, who you guys are or what you guys do. I'm still a very new to this world. Um, you know, Ed, Ed reached out to me. I think it's incredibly interesting. That's why I wanted to talk to you guys because I would love to be on the forefront or just help in any way possible, increase transparency, better these systems, help with any regulation that's going to allow for better overall integrity of these sports. Integrity is such a funny word, especially in basketball. You know, Adam Silver, if you guys Google Adam Silver integrity, whatever, you're going to find some really interesting stuff, right? Because Adam Silver, uh, when, when sports betting, um, you know, when the New Jersey law, when, when it got legalized in 2018 or 19, I forget the year, but I was at Action Network, which is a sports betting, you know, I was working at the time at Action Network, which is a sports betting company website, you know, betting service thing. Um, so it was a really interesting time to, to be there and to hear Adam Silver just constantly refer to the fact that the NBA needs some of this betting money to ensure in its integrity with officials, because obviously historically that, that is a completely laughable stance, right? It's so, so the concept, the concept of dealing with states uh, authorized sports betting on sports concept of the league with the federation taking money and just taking it on the state control. Uh, that may not be you cut out a little. I'd say that one more time. I said the concept of a, of a league basically funding their own integrity program. Uh, so it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like a guy uh, who's the controller of a business is embezzling money from his audit process, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know? So, and I can explain how that works in basketball just to give you guys some perspective. And also, you know, I've been doing a lot of research on, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Ted Wells, but there's a process, you know, this during the NBA betting scandal, they hired an attorney named Lawrence Pedowitz out of New York to do an independent investigation into uh, the NBA betting scandal. Ted Wells was brought on uh, most notably for deflate gate by the NFL. You know, there's this idea that the league is going to hire independent investigators to, to really get to the bottom of all these scandals, right? And again, that is a complete joke. Um, the league with the NBA and with its officials, the system in place is, uh, as Ed alluded to earlier, right now, the league selects referees for, for every game, right? So the NBA has complete control over which officials uh, officiate each game. And the way it works is those officials make a lot of their money during the NBA playoffs, NBA playoff bonus money, some officials can really get close to doubling their salary if they work throughout the playoffs, you know, from the first round of the finals. And they are, so there was an understanding, especially in the Don here, it's gotten clear. I want to be unequivocally clear. It's gotten better, right? This doesn't, when you watch NBA games now, I don't think you need to have the same level of skepticism that you had during the Donahue era. But the way it works is those officials are, are getting assigned by the NBA 
And again, going back to the early 2000s, the NBA had, there's a clear prerogative, right? The NBA officials knew which teams the NBA wanted to advance. They knew in 2002, officials knew that Kobe Bryant and Shaquille O'Neal were going to be far better in an NBA finals than Chris Webber and Vladi Divac, um, the most controversial NBA series of all time, the 2002 Western Conference Finals. There are countless other examples of that era of just egregious, egregious officiating, um, extremely controversial officiating that we now can look back and acknowledge was corrupted, <laughs> right? And it's super vague. You know, there's not like, it's not like David Stern sent a memo to his officials saying like, hey guys, I just want to remind you to manipulate the game in this way and make sure that this team wins. None of that exists. It was, it was an unspoken understanding. So you can look at, you know, there's some people that I think will listen or just look back that era and be like, no, there's not enough proof, there's not enough evidence. And of course, you know, that's all, those people are always going to exist. But I think if you're a rational human being, you can look at these systems and look at just normal human behavior and referees, they call the game a certain way, they make more money and they oh get more assignments. And it's, you know, if you follow the money in these things, it's pretty obvious to, to find out, you know, see what happened. So again, with your, with the NBA, I can go on and on about how those systems were set up for just unbelievable corruption um, at all levels and how the money. Relief that in the New York Post it kind of tipped everybody's hand to pull back, and it was the manipulation of to basically block the federal investment. Uh, if you could just talk a little bit about that, that would. Ed, you're cutting out, say one more time, you're cutting out a little bit. I'm trying to hear you. If, if, if you could talk a little bit about what happened to the FBI investigation that they had to uh, short, short circuit because of the leak to the New York Post. Uh, if you could just talk a little bit about that and how that kind of boss, because if you really wanted to find out, you would need to have a criminal investigation. And frankly, you would need to, to be able to gain access through a subpoena to the emails and the, the, uh, the cell phone records. Yeah, so that's that's a fascinating part of the NBA side of the story. So what happened in 2007, so Tim Donahue got caught, excuse me, on a Gambino wiretap. So five major crime families in New York, the Gambinos are at that time and, and still today, probably the, the most, I don't wanna say biggest, most renowned. I mean, they're, the Gambino crime family is a, a big, still has a big presence in New York. And of the five major crime families, they're probably the most influential. And so Tim Donahue's bets um, at that, that year, 2006, 2007, Tim Donahue's bets were being filtered to the Gambino crime family, to the Philadelphia, to several, to two different distinct Philadelphia mob families. And there was a, a handful of professional bettors that were very aware of Donahue fixing games and we're making tens of millions and sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars off of just Tim Donahue's games. One referee's games from 2003 to 2007, they were making just incredible amounts of money. And so the Phil Scala, the FBI agent I mentioned earlier, he was the head, you know, his job was to investigate the Gambinos. So Scala led a, a group of agents who were solely focused on the Gambinos. And through one of their informants, they got wind of a referee who was fixing games. And so what happened at that point was they start, you know, they started looking into it and they started watching the games and they started listening more and they started observing more. And they, and they quickly found out that there was a lot here. Um, and they brought in this referee to Tim Donahue and Donahue sung like a proverbial canary from the get go. Tim was, he knew he was caught. He decided his strategy was to, get out in front of it and just tell them everything. And what he told him, the big thing he told him was like, hey, what I'm doing is bad, but what the, NBA do, what the NBA is doing is far worse. And what the FBI was going to do was, um, they were gonna put a, a mic on Tim Donahue. They were gonna have him call based and, and have those conversations. 
Um, can you guys hear me? We're good. Okay, sorry, I thought I might have connected my headphones. So they were going to have Tim Donahue wire up and go out and really talk to a lot of people in his network, NBA officials, executives, players, and have basically everybody acknowledge this incredibly corrupt system that everybody in the system is cognizant is corrupt, right? They were all, everybody was aware of how this worked, of how referees were compensated, of how referees had a, a very, very clear, but also um, a clear and unambiguous goal of who, which teams were to advance. They were essentially, you know, that was going to be the FBI investigation. They were going to use Donahue as a mole, and they were going to expose everything about the NBA that we exposed in our podcast. But the FBI made a big mistake. They went to NBA Commissioner David Stern in the early stages of their investigation and told him what they were doing. And David Stern said, we will cooperate and do everything we can to aid your investigation, and we want to get to the bottom of this too, yada, yada, yada. And what David Stern was able to do very quickly was a couple of things. He negotiated, he went to his partners, Turner and ESPN, right when he, you know, shortly after finding out about this and negotiated $7 billion in TV deals with those two partners. So he negotiated the biggest NBA, and again, NBA TV deals will continue rising forever, most likely, but he went with knowledge of the scandal and negotiated the largest TV contracts in the history of the league, knowing that the scandal in the league's history was coming down the pike shortly. Um, and then he did a couple of brilliant things. Um, he, David Stern, the commissioner of the NBA, leaked the scandal. He leaked the biggest scan. He leaked news of the biggest scandal in the league's history in order to essentially hush up everybody in his organization. Right. Think about how brilliant that is and how absolutely conniving and sinister and just the evil brilliance of David Stern. I could go on for two hours in this call about, but the NBA leaked the news. And what they were able to do was essentially sabotage the entire FBI investigation. FBI made a huge mistake going to Stern. And they did so because former FBI agent Bernie Tolbert was Stern's head of security. So they thought they had a duty as FBI agents to inform you know, a, a comrade that this was happening. And they also felt that they, they felt sure that at that point, their investigation was going down a path where they felt like they were going to uncover all this and they, they, they had it. And David Stern beat him to the punch. He leaked the story. There was a gag order. Everybody in the NBA knew what was basically, you know, it was communicated through the right channels that everybody in the NBA hushed up. Nobody said a word about Tim Donahue. Everybody knew to label him as a, as a rogue criminal. That's the big word that Stern used. He was a rogue, isolated. This is nothing to see here. It's one bad guy. It's all him. We're good. And the entire investigation was sabotage. And it's, it's brilliant. It was, it was absolutely a brilliant chess move by David Stern, but I don't think people realize how close the NBA was to a scandal that really, I mean, could have it really jeopardized going back to the word integrity. Um, I don't, I don't see how the NBA could have bounced back from that. If, if everything was exposed at that time um, now, 15 years later, I think the NBA I think fans can look back and acknowledge that, yeah, it was bad and still, still, I don't know, enough time has passed to where maybe that wounds, those wounds have healed. I don't know about Sacramento. I don't know if there's anybody from Sacramento in the audience, maybe your wounds haven't healed, but that, that kind of manipulation, I mean, the NBA was really, really close to just having a scandal that would have made, you know, steroids and baseball look incredibly small in comparison. You know, when we spoke on the phone, Tim, I talked to you about the, the Los Angeles Rams, New Orleans Saints uh, playoff game and how a, a non-call in the final minutes of that game, you know, all the momentum was going toward the Saints, pretty much changed the outcome. And then it came out afterwards, I think it was what, three out of four, or but anyway, where the refs were from Los Angeles. That hit me whether there was anything on board there or not, certainly the appearance of a conflict of it, definitely. To me, it offended me that you don't really, in a playoff game, have referees that come from the city of one of the teams. How does that happen? Um, 
easily. There's no transparent, like we as fans don't know anything about these referees. They're all in, in all sports. They're all shadowy figures that we just are supposed to trust. Um, and again, I say shadowy figures. Officials are supposed to exist in the shadows. I think we as fans get really frustrated and angry in cases like that, where there's just complete ineptitude that leads to uh, the wrong team going to the Super Bowl. But I think we as fans, um, like we're told just to be quiet and trust that those referees, officials, umpires are completely unbiased and the best in the world and are going to make sure that these games have complete integrity. And it's obviously in, in many instances, just not the way it works. In, in 20, I believe it was the, I forget which Super Bowl it was, but um, I don't know if I told you this on the phone, Carolina Panthers, Denver Broncos Super Bowl. I forget which year that was, the Cam Newton, the Broncos crushed them. Um, but there was a play early on in that game where it was a very controversial replay. I forget the scenario, but it was, I think, third and long, Cam Newton threw, threw a pass over the middle. The guy, it looked like to me, caught it. And it was ruled incomplete. And then we, we figured the next day, and this, this was picked up by a couple agencies, but didn't really go viral. I think if the game was closer, it might have. But we found out, we, we, I went on Facebook. It wasn't even, as far as an investigation, it wasn't, it wasn't a really complex one. I looked up the replay officials, and one of the replay officials in that game had hundreds of pictures of himself wearing Denver Bron going to Denver Broncos games and was clearly, I mean, this guy was a huge Denver Broncos fan. He was the guy in the replay booth tasked with making the decision. And again, it wasn't, if it was a closer game, that was a huge play in that game. It was a huge, if there's any Panthers fans in that game, just, just know that was a huge turning point in the game. Panthers would have gotten a first down. They would have been driving again. We all follow sports enough to where, you know, those, those plays matter a lot. And that's another example of just how, how does that happen? How does the NFL allow that to happen? How? And it's because we can't trust the NFL. We can't trust the NBA. The, these sports need regulation. They need transparency. And again, I, I, you know, I'll say it again. I'm just, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited that this conversation's happening. And I hope, you know, that this room can be at the forefront of that because things, things are changing. Uh, my life's work is going to be, putting this out there from a story standpoint from, you know, just do my job journalistically to get these things out there and to try and force people's hands to make them more transparent. But I don't know enough about, about how, about government and regulation and, and what you guys do to, to speak really intelligently about that right now, but God is it. I can spend a lot of hours. <laughs> so yeah, it's, cra it's crazy that Rams, I mean, you know, again, you, you trust, trusting, trusting the leagues is not the right approach. So right? let me ask you this question. And I, I, so we have a new uh, a horse racing integrity and safety authority. And there was a blue ribbon nominating committee to prove and point people to be on the board. And the individual that they selected to run the anti-doping committee uh, used to run the NFL's anti-doping program. Is that something we should be concerned? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I'll give you an example of, of the inept, of how the NFL's, again, I go back to the, the IQ tests for NFL and NBA in particular, as far as their doping programs. <laughs> so H, HGH in the NFL, I would estimate HGH and testosterone in the NFL it's hard. It's hard to say whether it's 75 or 90 or it's a majority of players use HGH and testosterone in the NFL. Now there's a, there's a different debate for how, you know, HGH and anabolic steroids are two very different things. There's a lot of players that use steroids in the NFL too. NFL has a massive doping problem that it is completely cognizant of, and they just want these players to be as big and fast and strong and, and they don't care right? It's, it's similar to baseball in the late nineties. They know it's there. They, they have their test. They don't care. This is public. You guys can Google this, but the NFL's HGH testing program. If I'm the starting linebacker for the Oakland Raiders or for the, excuse me, the Vegas Raiders at this point, if I, for me to get caught doing HGH or testosterone, I would have to do first off a lot. Um, it's not like a moderate dose of HGH probably wouldn't even show up, but 
I would have to do a lot of HGH and get tested within 24 hours with the NFL's test for that to show up. <laughs> and then at that point, whether the NFL enforces it or whether they kind of just discard it, uh, like golf has done with Tiger Woods's and numerous other big golfers, I, I don't know. But the NFL's doping program, again, just do some, do some simple Google searches on HGH NFL doping testing. You know, it's, it's, not, it's an IQ test. It's not made to actually catch people. I think you guys got to be careful because a lot of these so-called, the guys who architect these doping programs are doing so with the leagues, or I, again, I'm not in horse racing. I'm not sure who the entity would be, but they're doing so in, in an effort to circumvent, right? They're, they're doing so in an effort to not catch people, to say really their job in a lot of these cases is to, is to paint a picture of a really thorough um, really thorough doping program that in reality is made to not catch anybody ever. So that's, that's the NFL currently, and that's how it's set up. And the NFL is probably the most egregious of all of them, to be honest. The, uh, I'm going to open this up if anybody has a question. So I think probably better here this morning. Uh, get, get up, go to the mic so everyone so can hear you. Not in the room. Just directly to the last point, Kim knows. Uh, I've been told that in the NFL, the testosterone level is acceptable uh, for a test is multiples of the average male testosterone. Uh, if, if he could answer that, uh, because in horse racing, Kim, we test at picogram levels. Uh, so we, we test down to a very minute level, whereas the NFL acceptable <coughs> levels on are greatly above what. Yeah, that's interesting. And that's, and that's a good point. Look, it's, it's vague. And that's why, you know, anabolic steroids are pretty easy, not easy, but you know, it's, it's a lot easier to catch somebody who's doing anabolic steroids or some version of anabolic steroids at this point, than HGH and testosterone for those reasons. And there's another, honestly, you know, not to go on a tangent, but I, I'm kind of at this point, my studies of HGH and testosterone, I'm, I'm okay with, with especially um, athletes over the age of 30 being prescribed those things, but that's a different story. They, they are illegal and so they got to be tested for. So, yeah, I think it's, it sounds like it's different and I don't know anything about horse racing testing. I'm, I'm really interested to learn, but in, in the NFL, yeah, it's that ambiguity of I'm a male. I have testosterone. How much, how much do I have naturally? How much, um, if I, you know, inject myself a couple of days and then when the drug tester knocks on my door, say that I'm sick so I can delay that test 24 hours. And then, you know, the next day, next morning, when I get tested, how much is coming out in my urine? I mean, that's the, that kind of ambiguity is what these guys thrive off of. So when it comes to horse racing, yeah, I, I think those are the interesting questions to ask. And, and yeah, is the trust there? It seems like you guys do a, a pretty good job based on my very minimal research. I'm sure undoubtedly it's better than the NFL and the NBA, but yeah, it's, it's that ambiguity when it comes to testosterone and, and, and human growth hormone that makes these things really easy to circumvent. But it's also, you know, as somebody who looks into this stuff, it's, it's laughable that you actually, you know, that I don't know if fans care, but if they did um, or if they do, it's just not, these tests are not really made to catch people. So that's, that's the problem. I'll tell you about like, horse racing, uh, drug testing. Half the industry thinks it's no good. The other half of the industry thinks it's too good. <laughs> so go figure that one out. Uh, Tim, question about the NDA and the changes that were made in the subsequent years. You said how things have improved. Um, I presume you're talking a few things about the replay officials, replays, talking more about uh, decisions that were made. And in particular, the introduction of the last two minute reports can you talk about what you found and, and how things have improved in subsequent years? And, um, I guess you know, the NBA's realization changes. So the two-minute report's really, it's interesting, right? I mean, the two-minute report is the only hard piece of, of legislation that the NBA produced in the wake of all this that really was their effort to increase integrity. And the two-minute report, they have admitted 
you know, in big games, like, Hey, the referees messed this call up. Right. So what does that, what does that do for fans and for people that love this? It still doesn't make it's, it's complicated. Right. I mean, the NBA is in a really tough spot. What I think they've done better is that they've, they've been that they, during the Donahue era, this going back to Donahue, we get into this, some podcasts refereeing was completely, was a completely nepotism based system. I mean, a lot of these referees were for this from the same, neighborhood in philadelphia and the way you got recruited to be an nba referee wasn't you know a pure pure meritocracy right it was hey you know billy's kid's pretty good and you know he's reffing in the the cba right now and you know i lost two grand a billion poker and he should probably you know maybe we bring this kid up and he'll it was literally it was that those were the guys that were trusting and trusting the biggest games in nba history during that era too they were not there because of merit they were there because you know um somebody's uncle scratched you know it was literally it was that and now the nba does a, a better job of recruiting referees based on merit so there are better referees refereeing these games now and there are you know i think there are there are a lot of just good referees and in that era there's a lot of really bad referees but refereeing is still it's still an nba run system right there's we're always going to have to question in the NBA whether a referee, like we don't know anything about these guys and and women. We don't know anything about these people who are refing these games. We don't know if secretly, yeah, they love the Lakers or the Bulls or the Knicks and they want those teams to win. We don't know whether there's no forensic accounting. We don't know whether or not they've gotten a mysterious ten thousand dollar check or ten thousand, you know, deposited ten thousand dollars in cash to their accounts or their wife's account those those checks and balances don't exist so the nba has gotten better in the sense that it's hiring is better the two minute report i think you know referees know that exists and and are actively trying not to mess things up in the last two minutes of a game so there have been some checks and balances put in place but man um the system it's as somebody who you know has investigated this a lot over the years i mean there's Who's to say that all the referees in, in this year's playoffs aren't on the take? Can't tell, can't tell you, can't ensure you they are. There's absolutely nothing I can do to say that Scott Foster or Tony Brothers or some of these big referees that came up with Donahue, who in some way or another have been implicated in the Donahue scandal. So one thing we reveal on the podcast, there's a guy named Scott Foster who's still refing the biggest NBA games, who exchanged <laughs> I forget. I knew this number off the top of my head for years um, from October to like during the peak of the we were essentially talking twice a day, every day. Um, and we have a lot of evidence to implicate Scott Foster in this based on phone records and just based on logic. And Scott Foster's still refing the NBA. NBA has not let stock Scott Foster go. He's still charged. We're supposed to as fans, and trust these games to Scott Foster and his whistle. That still exists, even after this podcast came out. After the Netflix doc, we'll see. But the system is still ripe for corrupt, ripe for corruption. And there's absolutely, as an NBA fan, I'm still, I still watch, not as much as I used to. But there's absolutely, when when people, you know, my role on Twitter now, I guess, is just for people to vent when it comes to NBA referees. And and there's absolutely nothing I can tell them to ensure nothing I can make them feel uh, there's no, there's no integrity in the system at this point where it's gotten a little better, but really just because the NBA had such a PR nightmare on its hands that they've, they've taken min, a couple minimal steps, but the way you make this better is to, again, architect a system where these referees are held accountable for their actual accounting. Right. I mean, we have no way, we have no way of knowing, whether there's nobody really looking over NBA referees to, to know whether or not they're working like Donahue was with actual gangsters to, to fix games. It's just that system is still, it, it doesn't exist. And the sport is still absolutely ripe for, ripe for corruption from an NBA or from a refereeing standpoint. Does anybody have any other questions? Ken, come on up to the mic. Fascinating to talk about. I know a little about. Let me ask a different one. Talk to us about the NCAA. 
how the players are being segregated, paid, whether they're getting stuff for their likeness. Now they've got millions of dollars to handle. I know some of them cars. Not only how many of them could that be really what they call not to. Plus which they need to get away with. And NCAA, but the uh, NCAA is an absolute mess, right? They had the, so the my issue with the NCAA is that they had an opportunity to implement some sort of system for the past. I mean, for 20 years, we've we've known at least 20 years. I mean, probably longer, right? Closer to 30 years. The system has existed in major college sports, particularly basketball and football, where top recruits were getting paid tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, in some cases millions under the table by boosters by various entities right and so the nba the ncaa this is the same thing they knew this existed right and they had an opportunity to do something to regulate it and they just kept pushing it off and kept saying you know we're not going to pay these players like whatever you know all the all the things that have come to a head now with the nil um and i think it's the same situation that all sports are in um you can either be proactive or reactive and they they were reactive, to say the least, and now it's it's an even bigger mess than it was before. And I don't the NCAA is tough because, yeah, they're they're college, you know, they're they're student athletes, but no, they're not. <laughs> so I don't know what the NCAA is going to do. I, I think the best solution for college sports is, I think the NCAA at this point is completely superfluous, and I think they've made themselves superfluous. I think college sports will likely. In the next five to 10 years, all the major conferences will join and push the NCA out. And the NCA asked for that, essentially, by not by by pretending that a, a huge, massive institutional problem didn't exist. And they're at a point now where they're unnecessary. So I think the NCA, I think that's where it's going. I don't know if it will go there. But yeah, the NCA is it's really it's sad. It's sad that college sports now is is at where it's at and there there aren't any easy solutions whereas if they really were transparent going back to that word and and say and said 20 years ago hey we we know there's an issue here we're going to try and create a system that again because i have a big i know i know athletes i know a lot of athletes who grew up dirt poor and who went to these colleges went to big colleges and were making the ncaa millions upon millions of dollars and couldn't you know were eating we're, we're literally like waiting in the school cafeteria to get leftovers because they couldn't afford a meal. So the, that exists. And they knew that existed. And that's tragic that those athletes exist. And my wife who went to Alabama, Tyrone Prothrow, who made the, the guy who made the catch in the guy's helmet, the greatest catch in NCAA history and blew out his knee shortly thereafter. You know, that guy is living a, a very, a very simple life in Tuscaloosa, Alabama and was never afforded the things that he really needed to succeed, right? I mean, he was, he never really went to school. Um, he never really got to capitalize on on his minute of fame. He never, you know, so again, the, the system, I don't have an eloquent solution for the NCAA system, but I think what's the learning lesson is that they had an opportunity to really, to, to sit down and to find, to start architecting a system that would help these student athletes help you know and give fans what they want right we we just want we want what the ncaa used to be what college sports used to be i think i the game has completely changed that the ncaa tournament is still great but man college sports is a really really tough spot where it's going to essentially become college sports i can't imagine another way you know i can't imagine a world where it won't and again it's because they were completely reactive instead of you know really passionate about creating a system that worked for everybody and they had an opportunity to do it and they didn't. Big follow up. What interests me the most about this study in this business, and I've actually spoken to them about this, I'm telling you very clearly. The thing that amazes me most is the NCAA allows sports women now legal to take place. They get nothing, supposedly. Because I said to some of them in a certain meeting, why in the world would you put the show? Why don't you model the NCAA have this existing place for some gas and casinos? It should be the same, could do the same thing with their gas. Why would you let people that knew you for hundred million dollars on your games do you nothing for it? Unless they're getting something out of it. You're not going back, that may be your podcast or story. 
Why yeah. don't you get something for their names? That yeah. I mean, it's a good, it's a, I, I wish I had an answer, but it's, it's again, it's, if you're looking at, obviously there have been Boston College, Arizona State, there have been college basketball and college sports game fixing scandals. And I can't, you know, if you're, if you're playing at Niagara, you know, if you're, if you're a small time division one athlete and, you know, these games are so easy to bet on, I don't see it. Same as tennis. I mean, it's just so, it's so easy for, for corruption to exist in, in these systems. Right. So yeah, I wish I had a, I wish I had an answer, but ultimately I think you bring up a, you know, why, why can you bet on these games? It's a really good question. And then how do you regulate it? How do you regulate? I mean, there's so many, it's NBA, NFL, there's really a, a very manageable amount of games being played on a given day in a given season. NCA, there's so many teams, um, they're, they're spread out all over the country. I mean, a lot of these schools, you know, St. Peter's, I forget what their athletic budget was, but it was, you know, it was laughable, right? I mean, these, who, these, these smaller schools, you can't tell me that every single season there isn't a couple of, a couple of small schools in the NCAA where the star point guard or the star player on some of these teams isn't taking some money to manipulate, you know, the final score based on point spread. You can't. My point is not to say fixing or rigging the game. My point is to say that you see the NCAA as an opportunity to potentially model their system off the racing system simultaneously. Everybody they get to legitimately get set to take the burden off paying the athletes. In addition to that, I believe that enough money is involved that every NCAA school in the country at every level, one, two, and three, and every sport, male and female, could have all of their scholarships funded. That meant all that money that was going to the athletes could be for other programs. NCAA is missing the bus. No, 100%. I mean, Again, I wish I wish the NCA. I, I I totally agree. I mean, I just wish the NCA. I think there's a lot of greed at the top, just like all these all these organizations. So, but I I agree with you. We're gonna uh, start. Tim, I really appreciate your time this morning. I really look forward to having some more in-depth conversation. My pleasure. Um, again, thank you guys for having me. Um, anything I can do to help, please let me know, and um, look forward to seeing what kind of work you guys do over the coming years. Very exciting. Again, Ed, just the fact that, you know, you guys are thinking about this and, and really as passionate, I think, as I am is extremely humbling and fulfilling and just super exciting. So anything I can do, let me know. Otherwise I'll just be in my basement, my unfinished basement, investigating all these sports scandals. And well, I think you've got, plenty, you've got plenty of work ahead of you. I'll help you understand horse racing. <laughs> I think there's a lot of people in the room who are saying you may think horse racing is bad on, on on any given day. We certainly all know what our challenges are, where we can improve. And try to do that. But boy, <laughs> listening to you uh, doesn't absolve us of our responsibility on horse racing. It sure is it's a virgin territory when it comes to human sports. So I appreciate you being with us. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thank Thank you, then we'll be back.